What did it feel like to have to really reach up or even have a ladder How wonderful. to work your hives? How wonderful. How wonderful that was. It was only occasionally that I would have one tall enough that I had to have a step ladder. Hello and welcome to Notes from the Bee Yard. You're listening to Episode 6, Supering Up. The volume of honey a single colony can produce is astonishing if the bees and the beekeeper are ready when nectar is flowing. Honey production is about timing and luck, and years ago it was possible to collect towers of excess honey, sometimes needing a ladder to step up. My name is Laura Tyler, I'm your producer and host. This is episode 6, Supering Up, written and read by Colorado beekeeper Tom Theobald. Stay tuned through the end to hear Tom and I chat about the two-queen beekeeping method that helped him do well as a small-scale honey producer. Is it still doable today? The bee yards look like city skyscrapers viewed from afar, like downtown Denver coming in from the north on I-25. Hardly noticeable in March as they sat nestled on the prairie or tucked in beside a stream. Each colony is now as high as my head, and the bee yards stand out clearly in the distance. The booming two queen colonies require ample super room to prevent swarming and contain their large population, and a two queen yard supered up for the summer is a dramatic sight. When the flows begin, even more supers will go on until I can just reach the top with outstretched arms. On rare occasions, with exceptional colonies, I may even have to pack along a stepladder to work on the top supers. Even passers-by with no knowledge of beekeeping can tell at a glance that something extraordinary is going on out there. I put honey supers on the colonies for two reasons. First, to provide additional room but ultimately to store the incoming honey, since I'm in the business of producing honey, not simply raising bees. At this point in the season, though, the supers are filled with nothing more than promise. While the bee yards may look impressive, I know only too well that no surplus of any consequence has been stored yet. Inside the supers, the bees are hard at work nevertheless and one of the marvels of beekeeping starts soon after the bees receive the supers. The frames of honeycomb can be reused for many years, and this saves the bees the work of creating comb from scratch each year. It also saves considerable honey, since the bees must consume about 7 pounds of honey to produce 1 pound of beeswax. Honey that would otherwise be consumed for wax production can be stored as part of the surplus. But still, a fair amount of minor damage is done to the combs at harvest time. Cells are torn, distorted, or smashed when the combs are uncapped and the honey extracted. The bees quickly start to work on these damaged combs, repairing cells and reconstructing the comb to their very special tolerances. Then each cell is meticulously cleaned and polished. Only then will the colony begin to use the supers for honey storage. Even though I've seen this many times, when I return to inspect supers put on a few days earlier and find them repaired and ready to go, I am impressed once again by this natural system of recycling and rejuvenation. The hot, dry weather through June is presenting a perplexing problem for beekeepers. While we are having one of the better blooms of sweet clover in years, my checks of the bee yards show very little honey being stored. Normally, sweet clover is one of the most prolific sources of nectar we can get here along the Front Range. And it is discouraging to drive by fields of yellow bloom 
only to find on inspection that the bees are bringing relatively little in. Flowers don't automatically produce nectar. They must pump subsoil moisture up through their vascular systems to organs called nectaries. These in turn produce the sweet liquid which attracts a variety of pollinating insects. Because the soil is so dry, relatively little nectar is being produced, and that which is is quickly evaporated, leaving little for the bees. The heat also places a burden on the workforce of the colonies. Bees go to great lengths to keep the hive temperature constant. The brood must be maintained at an even temperature or death can result. And if the temperature continues to rise, even adult bees begin to succumb to suffocation or overheating. To control temperature, bees use two primary methods, ventilation and evaporative cooling. Water is brought back to the colony where hive bees place it in small droplets around the rims of the cells. Within the hive and at the entrances, many bees stand stationary with wings fanning rapidly. The result is that large volumes of air are drawn through the hive, evaporating the water and bringing down the temperature. In a good honey flow, much of this cooling takes place during the course of evaporating the thin nectar as it is being converted to honey. In the absence of a honey flow, more and more of the field force must be diverted from foraging to carrying water and fanning. The honey supers play an important role in this hot weather also. Even though they are empty, they allow the bees to distribute themselves over a much greater area, dispersing the heat within the hive. Except for my sister-in-law Virginia, who comes from Phoenix tomorrow and is worried about being cold in Colorado, I don't know of anyone who enjoys this heat. But Colorado weather tends to extremes, and this heat may continue until September, or we may be flooding out next week. If the clover fails, the crop will depend upon the second cutting of alfalfa. If that fails, well, it won't be the first time I've brought in loads of empty supers at year's end, but I hope against that eventuality. Baking under this blazing sun, the land has the smell of a cotton shirt pressed with too hot an iron. Even our usual afternoon thunderstorms have failed us. As I return from the bee yards in the evening light, the mountains stand out against the setting sun. Jagged, two-dimensional pastel cutouts in blues and grays and greens, one behind the other, like some grand stage setting. And even these subtle colors are muted by a gossamer evening haze baked from the earth. The cooling shadows of the high peaks creep eastward one more time as another day blows by the window to cool my salt-caked skin. The heat will break, the flows will start, the rains will come tomorrow. So Tom, I heard a rumor that your two queen colony setup is going to be featured in the new edition of the ABCs and XYZs of bee culture. Yeah, I think I told you that. It's quite an honor, really. Now, two queen beekeeping, is that something that you could do with today's bees? Probably not. You know, I have wondered about that over the last few years, and I don't think uh, for a variety of reasons two-queen beekeeping would be practical today. Why not? A number of reasons, really. One of the keys to two-queen beekeeping is the fact that you have two queens. You've set up a colony which has two queens producing brood, the objective being to produce a large very large population of foragers. And one of the things that we've experienced within the last few years is 
frequent and unexplained queen failures. So if you go to all the work to set up a two-queen colony, you have to depend upon both of those queens doing their part. And with a tall stack of colonies, it's a tremendous amount of work to take that stack down just to assure that you have two viable queens. So for that reason alone, uh, probably no longer practical. So I wouldn't uh, recommend, other than for the experience, that, uh, that beekeepers attempt the two-queen system. Do you remember the last year where you had really tall hives? Boy, it's been several years now. I've, uh, I've been trying to deal with the loss of colonies and the loss of queens, and I've used every technique I can think of to keep my numbers up, and ultimately I, w I was unsuccessful. I kept losing more bees than I could replace until I was finally out of bees. It seems like these days, beekeepers, it's just a lot about keeping your bees alive. Yes, and my business was based upon the production and sale of high-quality table honey. I didn't take my bees to California, which has been what has saved many of the larger commercial beekeepers. That is, the pollination contracts that they get for bringing bees to the almonds. And I chose not to s send my bees out to California, and uh, ultimately my business failed. So, Tom, what was it like back in those days to have a really tall colony? Typically, a, a successful two-queen colony would be three hive bodies, deep boxes, and seven honey supers, which is about half the height of a hive body. And I would just be able to reach up high enough to crack the propolis seal on that top super and bring it down. I began to realize as time went on, as I got a little older, that having a 65-pound weight suspended above your head at the far highest you could reach was probably not a really good idea. <laughs> so <laughs> the, uh, the diminishment probably came at the proper time. Thank you for listening to the Notes from the Bee Yard podcast. We publish new episodes on Fridays at noon. Join us next week to hear episode 7, Nobody Motors Anymore. In the meantime, hop on over to notesfromthebeeyard.buzz and subscribe.